Hey Sugar, we're reading again tonight. It's about the Songbirds and Snakes. Susan Collins' Hunger Games novel. We're on chapter 26. Uh, and that will take us from page 410 to page 427 as we're moving along. And after tonight, we'll be, I think, only about 80 pages away to the end of this book. So we're getting close to the exciting conclusion of this great book. And I hope you'll enjoy it. And uh, it's been a pleasure. I would love every moment reading to you. And uh, hopefully it's a great conclusion to a very pretty entertaining story. So love you, sugar. I do, over and over again with all my heart. Let's get into it. Chapter 26, page 410 to 427, Hunger Games, Battle of Songbirds and Sakes, Susan Collins. Let's go. Chapter 26. Here we go. Love you. <clears throat> uh, Sejanus smacked himself on the forehead. Oh, how did the test go? Well, well, we'll see, I guess, said Coriolanus. They're sending it to the capital for Graydon. They said it could take a while before I get the results. You'll pass, Sejanus assured him. You deserve to. So supportive, so duplicitous, so self-destructive, like a moth to a flame. Coriolanus started a bit, remembering Pluribus's letter. Was that what Dean Highbottom had kept muttering after his fight with Coriolanus' father all those years ago? Almost. He used the plural, like moths to a flame, as if an entire flock of moths were flying straight into an inferno, a whole group bent on self-destruction. Who was he referring to? Oh, who cared? Drugged? Drug hate fueled old high as a kite bottom. Better not be, better not to even wonder. After dinner, Coriolanus put in his first hour of guard duty at an air hangar on the far side of the base, paired with an old timer who immediately dozed off. After instructing him to keep an eye out, he found his thoughts fixated on Lucy Gray, wishing he could see her or at least talk to her. It seemed a waste to be on guard, where clearly nothing ever happened when he could be holding her in his arms. He felt trapped here on the base, while she could freely roam the night. In some ways, it had been better to have her locked up in the capital, where he always had a general idea of what she was doing. For all he knew, Billy Top was trying to worm his way back into her heart at this very moment. <laughs> Why pretend he wasn't at least a little jealous? Perhaps he could have had him arrested, after all. Back in the barrack, he penned a quick note to Ma, praising the treats, and another to Pluribus to thank him for his help. Then to ask him about getting strings for Lucy Gray. His brain tired. His brain tired from the test. Coriolanus slept deeply and awoke, already sweating in the hot August morning. When did the weather break? September? October? By lunchtime, the line from the ice machine extended halfway through the mess hall. Slated for kitchen detail, Coriolanus braced himself for the worst, but found that he'd been upgraded from dishes to chopping. <coughs> chop, chop. This would have been a welcome change had he not been assigned to the onions. The tears he could live with, but he became increasingly concerned about the smell that radiated from his hands. Even after an evening of mopping, it still drew comment in the barrack, and no amount of scrubbing erased it. <coughs> Which he would be reeking when he saw Lucy Gray again? Friday morning, despite the heat and his unease around the Citadel scientists, he felt a certain relief that he'd be dealing with birds that afternoon. Though unlikable, they left no noticeable odor. When beanpole collapsed or in drills, the sergeant had his bunkmates haul him to the clinic, where Coriolanus took the opportunity to get a me metal can of powder for a heat rash that extended across his chest and under his right arm. Keep it dry, the, med the medic advised. He had to suppress the impulse to roll his eyes. He'd not been dry, not one moment, since he'd arrived in the steam bath of District 12. After a lunch of cold meat spread sandwiches, they bounced along in the truck to the woods, where the scientists still sporting their white lab coats awaited them. Just as they teamed up, Coriolanus learned that Bug, lacking a partner on Wednesday, had been working in tandem with Dr. K. She'd been so... <laughs> She'd been so impressed with his agility in the branches. She'd requested him again. It was too late to switch partners, so Coriolanus followed her group into the trees, hanging as far back as he could. It was no use, as he watched Bug carry a newly baited cage up into the first tree and swap it in with one holding a captured Jabberjay, Dr. Gay came up from behind him. <coughs> <coughs> so what do you think of the district's private snow? He was trapped like a bird. Trapped like the tributes in the zoo. Fleeing into the trees was not an option. He remembered Lucy Gray's advice that had saved him in the monkey house. Own it. He turned to her with a smile. Sheepish enough to acknowledge her nailing him, but amused enough to show he didn't care. You know, I think I learned more about Panem in one day as a peacekeeper than I did in 13 years of school. 
Dr. K laughed. Yes, there's a, world, there's a world of education to be had out here. I was assigned to 12 during the war, lived on, our, on your base, worked in these woods. You were part of the Jabberjay project then, asked Corlanus. At least they both had public failures. I headed it, said Dr. K significantly. A major public failure. Corlanus felt more comfortable. He'd only embarrassed himself in the Hunger Games, not a nation, nationwide war. Perhaps she would be sympathetic and give a favorable report to Dr. Gall on her return, if he made a good impression. Making an effort to engage her might pay off. He remembered that the Jabberjays were all male and couldn't reproduce with one another. So these Jabberjays, they were the actual birds you used for surveillance during the war? Mmm, these were my babies. Never thought I'd see them again. The general consensus was they wouldn't last the, the winter. The genetically engineered <coughs> often struggle in the wild. <coughs> But they were strong. My birds in nature has a mind of its own, she said. Bug reached the lowest branch and headed down the cage, holding the jabberjay. We should leave them in the traps for now. It wasn't the question, just a remark. Yes, it may help reduce the stress of the transition, agreed Dr. K. Bug nodded, slid to the ground, and accepted another fresh trap from Corlanus. Without asking, he made for a second tree. Dr. K watched approvingly. Some people just understand birds. Corlinus felt unequivocally that he would never be one of those people, but surely he could pretend to be for a few hours. He squatted down beside the trap and examined the jabberjay, which chattered away. You know, I never quite grasped how these worked. Not that he'd make any effort to find out. I know they recorded conversations, but how do you control them? <laughs> They've, they're trained to respond to audio commands. If we're lucky, I can show you. Dr. K pulled a small rectangular device from her pocket. Several colored buttons protruded from it, none of which were marked, but maybe age and use had, had worn the markings away. She knelt down across the cage from him and studied the bird with more affection than Corlanus felt befitted a scientist. Isn't he beautiful? Corlanus tried to sound convincing. Very. So what do you hear now, this chatter? It's his own. He can mimic the other birds, or us... Or say whatever he likes. He's in neutral, he said. In neutral? Corlanus asked. In neutral. He heard his voice echo from the bird's beak. In neutral? Even creepier when, when it's your own voice, he thought. But he gave a delighted laugh. <laughs> and that was me. That was me, the jabberjay said in his voice. And then began to mimic a nearby bird. It was indeed, do said Dr. K. But in neutral, he'll move on to something else. I'll move on to something else quickly. Another voice, usually just a short phrase or a snatch of bird song. Whatever catches his fancy for surveillance, we need to put him in rec in record mode, in record mode. <coughs> Fingers crossed. She pressed one of the buttons on her remote control. Corlanus heard nothing. Oh no, I guess it's too old. Doctor Doctor K's face, however, wore a smile. Not necessarily. The command tones are inaudible to human beings, but easily registered by the birds. Notice how quiet he is? The Jabberjay had fallen silent. It hopped around in its trap, cocking its head, pecking at things, the same in all ways except its verbalizing. Is it working? asked Corlanus. We'll see, Dr. K. Hit another button on our control. And the bird resumed its normal chirping. Neutral again. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Now let's see what he's retained. She pressed the third button. After a brief pause, the bird began to speak. Oh no, I guess it's too old. Not necessarily. The command tones are inaudible to human beings, but easily registered by the birds. Notice how quiet he is, the bird said. Is it working? We'll see. An exact replica. But no, the rustle of the trees, the buzzing of the insects, the other birds, none of that had been recorded. Only the pure sound of the human voices. Huh, said Corlanus, somewhat impressed. How long could they record for? An hour or so on a good day, Dr. K told them. <coughs> They're designed to seek out forested areas and then are attracted to human voices. We'd release them into the woods in, re in, re in record mode, then retrieve them with an hum and, uh, an hum and signal back at the base, where we'd analyze the recordings. Not just here, but in Districts 11, 9, wherever we thought they'd be of value. You couldn't just set microphones in the trees, Corlinus asked. You can bug buildings, but the forest is too large. The rebels knew the terrain well. We didn't. They moved from place to place. The Jabberjay is an organic mobile recording device, and unlike a microphone, is undetectable. The rebels could catch one, kill it, eat it, even, 
and all they would find is an ornery bird, explained Dr. K. They are perfect in theory. But in practice, the rebels figured out what, what they were, said Coriolanus. How did they manage that? Not entirely sure. Some thought they saw the birds return to base, but we only recall them in the dead of night, in which they are virtually impossible to detect, and only a few at a time. More likely, we didn't cover our tracks. It didn't make sure that the information we acted on could have had a source other than recording in the woods. That would have brought suspicion, and even th though their black feathers are an excellent camouflage at night, their activity after hours would be a clue. But then I think they just started experimenting with them, feeding us false information and seeing how we reacted. She shrugged. Or maybe they had a spy on the base. I doubt we'll ever really know. Why don't you just use the Haman device to call them back to the base now? Instead of... Cornelius stopped himself, not wanting to seem like a whiner. <clears throat> Instead of dragging you out in this heat to be eaten alive by mosquitoes, she laughed. <laughs> the whole transmission system was dismantled, and our old Avery seems to store supplies now. Besides, I'd rather have my hands on them. We don't want them to fly off and never come back, do we? Of course not, Corlaeus lied. Would they do that? I'm not sure what they'll do. Now that they've gone native, at the end of the war, I released them on neutral. It would have been cruel otherwise. A mute bird would, would have faced so, too many challenges. They not only survived, but m made it successfully with the mockingbirds. So now we have a whole new species, Dr. K pointed up, and a mockingjay in the foliage. Mockingjays, the locals call them. <clears throat> <clears throat> and what can they do, asked Corlanus. Not sure, I've been watching them for the last few days. They've no ability to mimic speech, but they have a better, more sustainability to repeat music than their mothers, she said. Sing something. Corlanus only had one song in his repertoire. Gem of Panem, Mighty City, Through the Ages, You Shine Anew. The Mockingjay cocked his head back and then sang back. No words, but an exact replica of the melody, in a voice that seemed half human, half bird. A few other birds in the area picked it up and wove into a harmonic fabric, which again reminded him of the covey with their old songs. We should kill them all. The words slipped out before he could stop them. Kill them all? Why? said Dr. K in surprise. They're unnatural. He tried to twist the comments so it sounded like it came from a bird lover. Perhaps they'll hurt the other species. They appear to be rather compatible, and they're all over Panin, wherever jabberjays and mockingbirds cohabitated. We'll take some back and see if they can, re re if they can reproduce. Mockingjay with mockingjay. If they can't, they'll all, they'll all be gone in a few years anyway. If they can... What's one more songbird, she said? <coughs> Corlanus agreed they were probably harmless. He spent the rest of the afternoon asking questions and treating the birds ger gently to make up for his callous suggestion. He didn't mind the Jabberjays so much. They seemed rather interesting from a military standpoint, but something about the Mockingjays repelled him. He distrusted their spontaneous creation, nature running amok. They should die out, and die out soon. At the end of the day, though, they found themselves in possession of over thirty Jabberjays. Not one Mockingjay had been caught in the traps. Perhaps the Jabberjays are less suspicious, given that the traps are more familiar to them. They were raised in cages, after all, mused Dr. K. No matter, we'll give them a few more days, and if needed, we'll bring out the nets. Or the guns, thought Corlanus. Back at the base, he and Bug were chosen to unload the cages and help the scientists position them in an old hangar that was to be the bird's temporary home. Would you like to help care for them until we take them back to the capital? Dr. K asked them. Bug gave one of the rare smiles in assent, and Coriolanus accepted with enthusiasm. Besides wanting to make a good impression, it was cooler in the hangar <laughs> with its industrial fans. It was cooler in the hangar with its industrial fans. That seemed better for the heat rash, which had flared up impressively in the woods. At least it made for a change. <laughs> Before lights out, the bunkmates laid, laid out Ma's treats and made a plan for the next two hob weekends, in case she didn't send boxes regularly. By virtue of his training skills, Smiley became their treasurer, carefully setting aside enough for two rounds of white liquor and donations into the covey bucket after the show. What remained, they divided five ways. For his share, Coriolanus took another six popcorn bowls, of which he allowed himself only one. The rest he would save for the covey. 
On Saturday morning, Coriolanus awoke to a hailstorm drumming away at the roof of the barrack. On the way to breakfast, the bunkmates pelted each other with, with ice balls the size of oranges, but by mid-morning, the sun came out stronger than ever. He and Bug were assigned to care for the Jabberjays in the afternoon. They cleaned cages, then fed and watered the birds under the direction of two of the Citadel scientists. Although some had been trapped in pairs with threesomes, each bird now resided in its own cage. During the latter part of their shift, they carefully carried the birds, one at a time, to an area of the hangar where a makeshift lab had been, sh had been set up. The Jabberjays were numbered, tagged, and run through basic drills to see if they still responded to the audio commands from the remote controls. All appeared to have retained the ability to record and play the human voice. Out of earshot of the scientist, Bug shook his head. Is that good for them? I don't know. It's what they built to do, it's what they're built to do, said Coriolanus. They'd be happier if we just left them in the woods, said Bug. Coriolanus wasn't sure Bug was right. For all he knew, they'd wake up in the Citadel lab in a few days, wondering what they what that atrocious ten year nightmare in District twelve had been. Maybe they'd be happier in a controlled environment where so many th threats had been removed. I'm sure the scientists will take good care of them. <coughs> After supper, he tried not to show his impatience as he waited for his bunkmates to ready themselves. As he decided to keep his romance secret, he planned to slip away once they arrived at the hob. That left the problem with Sejanus. He lied about the money, but maybe he was just trying to fit in with the rest of his penniless bunkmates. After the incident with the map, he'd seemed genuinely contrite, so hopefully he'd recognize the danger of acting as a go-between with Lil. But would Billy Top or the Rebels try to approach him again, since he initially expressed a willingness to help them? He was such a sit-in duck. The easiest thing would be to take him along to see the Covey once they'd given the others the slip. Want to come backstage with me, he asked Sejanus quietly when they'd reached the hob. Am I invited, asked Sejanus. Of course, said Corlanus, although really only he had been. Maybe it was good, though. If Sejanus could help Ma and I be entertained... <coughs> <laughs> if Sejanus could help Mon Ivory, if Sejanus could keep Mon Ivory entertained, I mean, then Coriolanus might get a few moments alone with Lucy Gray, but we'll need to shake the rest of the crew. This proved to be simple since the crowd had grown from the previous week, and the new batch of white liquor was particularly strong, leaving Smiley, Bug, and Beanpole to haggle. They found the door near the stage and exited onto a narrow, empty back street. What Lucy Gray had referred to as the shed turned out to be some sort of old garage that could hold about eight cars. The large doors used for vehicle entry were chained shut, but a smaller door in the corner of the building directly across from the stage door was held open with a cinder block. When Coriolanus heard chatter and instruments tuning, he knew they had the right place. They entered and found the covey and <laughs> commandeered the space, making themselves at home on old tires <coughs> and old bits of furniture, their instrument cases and equipment scattered everywhere. Even with the second door in the far back corner propped open, the place felt like an oven. The evening light poured in through a few cracked windows, catching the dust that floated thick in the air. When she saw them, Mon Ivory ran over, dressed in her pink frock. Hey there. Good evening, Coriolanus bowed and then presented her with a packet of popcorn balls, sweets to the sweet. Mon Ivory pulled back the paper and gave a little hop on one foot before she dipped into a curtsy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you kindly. I'll sing you a special song tonight. I came with no other hope, said Coriolanus. It was funny how the society talk of the capital seemed natural with the Covey. Okay, but I can't say your name, because you're a secret, she giggled. <laughs> Maud Ivy ran over to Lucy Gray, who sat cross-legged on an old desk. Turning her guitar, she smiled down at the child's excited face, but said sternly, Save them for after. Maud Ivy skipped over to show her treasure to the rest of the band. Sejanus so joined them while Coriolanus waved him past it and headed for Lucy Gray. You didn't need to do that. You're going to spoil her. Just trying to get some happy in her head, he said. How about my head, teased Lucy Gray. Coriolanus leaned in over and kissed her. Okay, that's a start. She scooted over and patted the desk beside her. Coriolanus sat and checked out the shed. What's this place? Right now, it's our break room. We come here before and after the show. And when we go off stage between numbers, she told them. <clears throat> <clears throat> but who owns it? He hoped they weren't trespassing. Lucy Gray seemed unconcerned. No idea. We'll just perch here until they shoo us off. Birds always, b birds, always birds with her. When it came to the covey, singing, perching, feathers in their hats. Pretty birds all. 
He told her about his assignments with the Jabberjays, thinking she might be impressed that he'd been singled out to work with them, but only seemed to make her sad. I hate to think of them caged up when they had a taste of freedom, Lucy Gray said. What do they expect to find back in their labs? I don't know if their weapons still work, he guessed. Sounds like torture, having someone controlling your voice like that. Her hand reached up and t- reached up to touch her throat. Uh, Coriolanus thought that a bit dramatic, but tried to sound comforting. I don't think there are human, there's a human equivalent. Really? Do you always feel free to speak your mind, Coriolanus Snow? She asked, giving him a quizzical look. Free to speak his mind? Of course he did. Well, within reason. He didn't go around shooting his mouth off about every little thing. What did she mean? She meant what he thought about the capital? And the Hunger Games and the districts, the truth was, most of what the capital did, he supported, and the rest really concerned him. But if it came to it, he'd speak out. Wouldn't he? Against the capital, like Sejanus had? Even if it meant repercussions? He didn't know, but he felt on the defensive. I do. I think you should say what you think. That's what my daddy thought, too, and he ended up with more bullet holes than I could count on my fingers, she said. What was she implying? Even if she didn't say so, he bet those bullets came from a peacekeeper's gun, perhaps from someone dressed exactly as Coriolanus was now, and my father was killed by a rebel sniper. Lucy Gray sighed. Ugh, now you're mad. No, but he was. He tried to swallow his anger. I'm just tired. I've been looking forward to seeing you all week, and I'm sorry about your father. I'm sorry about my father, but I don't run panic. Lucy Gray, Maud Ivory called across the shed. It's time. The covey had begun to assemble by the door, instruments in hand. I better go, Coraline slid off the desk. Have a good show. Will I see you after, she asked. He brushed off his uniform. I have to get back for curfew. Lucy Gray rose and swung a guitar strap over her head. I see. Well, tomorrow we're planning a trip to the lake, if you're free. The lake? Where Were there actually pleasurable destinations in this miserable place? It's in the woods, a bit of a hike, but the water's fine for swimming, she said. Sure would like you to come along. Bring Sejanus, too. We'd have the whole day. He wanted to go, to be with her for the whole day. He was still upset, but it was stupid. But she hadn't accused him of anything, really. The conversation had just gotten off track. It was all on account of those stupid birds. She was reaching out. Did he really want to push her away? He saw her so little he could not afford moodiness. All right, we'll come after breakfast. Okay, then. She planted a kiss on his cheek and joined the rest of the covey as they left the shed. Back in the hob, he and Sejanus pushed their way through the dim interior, the air heavy with sweat and liquor. They found their bunk mates in the same spot as the week before. Buck had secured uh, crates for them, and Coriolanus and Sejanus settled in on either side of him, each taking a swig from the communal bottle. Mon Ivory scampered out to introduce the band. The music began as soon as the covey had taken the stage. Coriolanus leaned against the wall and made up for lost time with the white liquor. He wasn't going to see Lucy Gray after, so why not get a little drunk? The knot of anger in his chest began to unwind as he stared at her. So attractive, so engaging, so alive. He began to feel bad about losing his temper and had trouble even remembering what she said to set him off. Maybe nothing at all. It had been a long, stressful week with the test and the birds and Sejanus's foolishness. He deserved to enjoy himself. He knocked back several more swallows and felt friendlier toward the world. Tunes familiar and new washed over him. Once he caught himself singing along with the audience and stopped self-consciously before he realized no one cared or was sober enough to remember much if they did. At some point, Barb Azor, Tam Amber, and, Cl- and Clerk Carmine left the stage, apparently to take a break in the shed, leaving Mon Ivory up on her box at the mic with Lucy Gray strumming beside her. Uh, I promised a friend I'd sing him something special tonight, so this is it, Mon Ivory chirped. Every one of us Covey owes our name to a ballad, and this one belongs to the pretty lady right here. She held out a hand to Lucy Gray, who curtsied to, sc- to scattered applause. It's a really old one, but for my, but by some man named Wordsmith, Wordsworth. It's a really old one, but some by some man named Wordsworth. We mixed it up a little, so it, so it makes be- better sense, but you still need to listen close. She pressed her finger to her lips, and the awning settled down. Coriolanus gave his head a shake and tried to focus. If this was Lucy Gray's song, he wanted to pay careful attention so he could say something nice about it tomorrow. 
Mon Ivory nodded to Lucy Gray for her intro and began to sing in a solemn voice. She sang, Oft I had heard of Lucy Gray, and when I crossed the wild, I, chan I chanced to see, it, uh, see at break of day the solitary child. No mate, no comrade Lucy knew. She dwelt where none abide, and the sweetest thing that ever grew upon the mountain side. Okay, so there was a little girl who lived on a mountain, and apparently had trouble making friends. You yet may sh spy the fawn at play, she sang, the hare among the green, but the sweet face of Lucy Gray will never more be seen. And she died, how? He had a feeling he was about to find out. Continued to sing, Tonight will be a stormy night. You to the town must go, and take a lantern, child, to light your mother through the snow. That father will I gladly do, tis scarcely afternoon. The village clock had just struck two, and yonder is the moon. And this is the father turned his hook. At this, the father turned his hook to, to kindling for the day. He piled his work, and Lucy took the lantern on her way. As carefree as the mountain doe, mountain dew, or doe, a fresh new path she broke. Her feet dispersed the powdery snow that rose up like, the, like smoke. The storm came on before its time. She wandered up and down, and many a hill did Lucy climb, but never reached the town. Ah, oh, lots of nonsense words, she sang, but she got lost in the snow. Well, no wonder if they sent her out in a snowstorm, and then she probably froze to death. Continued to sing, the wretched parents all that night went shouting far and wide, but there was neither sound nor sight to serve them as a guide. Continued to sing, at daybreak on a hill they stood that overlooked the scene, and hence and thence they saw the bridge of wood that spanned a deep ravine. They wept and turned and homeward cried, In heaven we all shall meet, When in the snow the mother spied The print of Lucy's feet. Oh, good, they found her footprints. Happy ending. It was one of those silly things, Like that song Lucy Gray sung about a man That he thought had frozen to death. They tried to cremate him in, in, uh, in an oven, But he only th thawed out and was fine. Sam somebody. Then downwards from the steep hill's edge, they continued to sing, they tracked the footmark small, and through the broken hawthorn hedge, and by the long stone wall, and then an open field they crossed, the marks were still the same. They tracked them on, not ever lost, and to the bridge they came. They followed from the snowy bank, those, foot, those footmarks one by one, into the middle of the plank, and further there were none. Wait, what? She vanished into thin air? Yet some maintain, she continued to sing, that to this day she is a living child, that you may see sweet Lucy Gray upon the lonesome wild, or through, or rough and smooth she trips along and never looks behind, and sings a solitary song that whistles in the wind. <laughs> that was the end of that song. Oh, a ghost story. Ah, boo, so ridiculous. Well... He tried hard to love it when he saw the Kobe tomorrow, but really, who named their child after a ghost girl? Although, if the girl was a ghost, where was her body? Maybe she got tired of her negligent parents sending her into blizzards and ran off to live in the wild. But then, why didn't she grow up? He couldn't make sense of it, and the white liquor wasn't helping. It reminded him of the time he hadn't understood the poem in, in rhetoric class, and Lavia Cardu had humiliated him in front of everyone. What a dreadful song. Maybe no one would mention it. No, they would. Maud Ivory would expect a response. So he'd say it was brilliant and leave it at that. What if she wanted to talk about it? Coriolanus decided to put it to Sejanus, who'd always been good at, re at rhetoric, just to see if he had any thoughts. But when he leaned across Bug, he found Sejanus's crate was empty. All right, well, that's the end of Chapter 26 of Ballad Songbirds and Saints, Hunger Games, and Officers and Collins. We'll pick up tomorrow with Chapter 27 on page 428. And let's see, we have 72 does. So we have 89 pages left in this great book, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. And I love you with all my heart, sugar. I do over and over again. Good night.